For this video, I have decided to compile two very grim shotter cases that I stumbled upon a while ago now. It's two that I've wanted to share for some time. Unfortunately, there isn't a ton of detail in these cases, so it isn't possible to make a full, in-depth video about either of them. The judges overseeing the cases decided it would be best for some of the information to be sealed for now. Svelana Batakova was a 46-year-old woman who was born in Russia, but had moved to a small island in Spain called Mallorca. She lived on the island with her husband, a 66-year-old man named Hans Henkels. Svelana was known as an animal lover and had several pets at her home, one of them being an American Staffordshire Bull Terrier. The couple had been together for just over two years and married for a few months. Despite being newly married, they had their fair share of issues. The police on the island were very familiar with the pair. In just a couple of months, the police had been called on several occasions to deal with their violent disputes and domestics. One night, Svalana was at a local bar alone. She had struck up a conversation with a man who was there drinking. Svalana confided in the man that she wished to kill her husband, but that she would need some assistance to do so. She offered this man 50,000 euros to help her murder Hans. Despite the offer of money, the man refused. Svalana decided to take matters into her own hands and would do the deed herself. On the 1st of April 2016, it's believed that Svalana was possibly able to slip Hans a sedative. Once it took effect, she retrieved a kitchen knife and began to viciously stab Hans, resulting in massive blood loss, ending his life. Svelana then grabbed Hans's arm and began to hack away the flesh, slicing small chunks at a time. She then called over her dog and began tossing pieces of flesh to him. She continued to hack away at her husband's arm for some time, eventually making her way all the way down to the bone. Some sources have even said that it's entirely possible that Hans could have very well been conscious during this time. He had recently gone through some surgery on his trachea, rendering him unable to talk and scream. It's theorized that she could have taken advantage of this opportunity. The crime scene analysis showed that there was no sign of struggle. After a couple of hours had passed, Svelana made a call to the police to tell them what she had done. They soon arrived and were met with a gruesome sight. They found her standing in a pool of blood, looking over her husband's body. Svelana was quickly arrested and charged with murder. She is said to have been under the influence of alcohol and other substances when she was arrested. She was sent to a psychiatric hospital and diagnosed with having a psychotic episode. It said that the episode was triggered by the substances she had taken. Despite this, she was deemed to be fit to stand trial. Svelana maintained that she was innocent during the trial, claiming that her dog had bitten and latched onto Hans's arm, and then ate the flesh, which she said caused him to bleed to death. A jury ruled that she was guilty of a lesser charge of homicide, meaning she was sentenced from anywhere between 10 to 15 years. Right now, you can go on Facebook and search her name. You'll find her profile, and there are plenty of pictures of her too, along with her beloved pooch. Jose Gorada was a 17-year-old who lived in Miami, Florida. He was described as a quiet boy who kept himself to himself and tried not to bother others. He attended school at the US Job Corp Center, located in a remote area of Miami-Dade. The school is surrounded by wooded areas with small roads leading into the woods. The Job Corps is a program that provides vocational training and boarding to at-risk youths between the ages of 16 and 24. Jose wanted to better himself and learn how to become a mechanic. On the 28th of June 2015, Jose had asked some of the Job Corps staff if he would be able to leave the campus to get some food. They said yes, and off he went. But Jose didn't return. Hours went by with no word from him. Days would pass, and nobody had seen him anywhere. On the third day of his disappearance, Jose's brother was desperately searching for him. He searched through the woods, not too far from where the school was located. In the woods, he was met with a sight that no brother should ever have to see. He saw feet poking out from the dirt in an area 
that looked to have been burned. He had found his brother dead, partially buried in the woods. Five suspects were arrested. Kahim Abello, aged 18. Desiree Strickland, aged 19. Jonathan Lucas, aged 18. Christian Colon, aged 19 and Joseph Cabrera, aged 20. These five people were known on campus for being bullies. It's thought that they had bullied Jose and on several occasions had even taken his money. On the 28th of June, they had lured Jose into the woods with the intention of carrying out a truly horrific crime. The group led Jose to a pre-dug grave, a grave they had actually dug two weeks prior with the intention that Jose would be buried there. In a nearby bush, they had also hidden a machete. Once they were deep enough into the woods where the grave was, the gang ambushed him. Kahim grabbed the machete and viciously struck Jose with it repeatedly. Jose tried his best to fight back, but he was simply outnumbered and overpowered. The group made him get into the pre-dug grave. Kahim then began to hit Jose with the machete until his face had been caved in. Jose collapsed into the grave from the attack, and as he lay in the grave wounded, the group used the shovel to bury him, and it's believed they buried him alive. While the group were beating Jose, Disarray had gone off behind a tree to urinate. She had missed a large part of the violence being inflicted. She was furious that the group had hacked Jose to death without her. Jonathan, Christian, and Joseph returned to the campus after burning Jose's items and cleaning the crime scene. But Disarray and Kahim wanted to celebrate. They weren't quite ready for it to be over yet. The two stayed behind and had intercourse right near the grave where Jose lay. Allegedly, Jose owed Kahim around $200, and this is believed to be the motive for the murder. Kahim, Jonathan, and Christian confessed to the crime shortly after they were arrested and gave a chilling account as to what happened to the police. Kahim was offered a plea deal to testify against the other suspects, but he rejected the offer. If he would have accepted the plea deal, he would have been able to avoid the death penalty and would have only been put behind bars for 10 years. There is part of an interrogation video involving Disarray where she screams at the officer telling him to let her go and that she had no involvement in the murder. Before the cameras were rolling, she had also headbutted a detective. And that's pretty much all the information I could find for this case. In 2017, the judge ordered that any additional information should be kept away from the public and journalists. I can imagine that some people who live locally may have heard some rumours and such. It's possible that this could change in the future, but for now, this is all we know about the tragic and brutal case of Jose.